How do we measure crime? There are numerous ways to approach answering this question, but three are most common. Official police records, victimization surveys, and self-reported offending surveys. The first and most common measure used are official records of crimes known to the police. The most prominent is the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting, or UCR, program. The UCR collects monthly and reports annually aggregate data from law enforcement agencies across the United States. The UCR's traditional summary reporting system includes eight types of crime, known as Part 1 Index Crimes, four violent crimes, murder, rape, robbery, and aggravated assault, and four property crimes, burglary, larceny, motor vehicle theft, and arson. Other crimes are captured as Part 2 Index Crimes, although far less is known about them and their reporting is more widely inconsistent. There's also additional supplemental data on homicides, hate crimes, and officers killed and assaulted in the line of duty. The strengths of the UCR are in its nationwide coverage, the ability to track crime over a long period of time, the data for the summary reporting system goes back to 1930, and the ability to link these data with other data from each police jurisdiction. There are also several limitations though to note with the UCR's summary reporting system. The program is voluntary. Not all police agencies report, though most do. For example, in 2020, 85% of the more than 18,000 police departments in the U.S. reported their data. The aggregate nature of the data, based on jurisdiction rather than incident, means many important questions about incidents, offenders, and victims cannot be answered. Annual reporting, as opposed to more frequent reporting. Sometimes preliminary numbers are reported quarterly, but usually the final report isn't released until the second half of the following year. The hierarchy rule. This is where only the most serious offense is counted if more than one occurred. So, for example, if a person robs a bank, beats a teller with a weapon, then shoots and kills a security guard while making an escape in a stolen car, multiple crimes have been committed, but only the murder will be counted. This obviously undercounts the amount of crime that is recorded for all crimes except for homicide. Another glaring problem is a commonality among all the Part 1 Index crimes. They are all street crimes. This creates a distortion of the overall picture of crime and what is thought of as a crime, as many crimes, such as economic crimes that don't occur on the streets, are not represented. To address some of these limitations, the FBI also has, as part of the UCR, the National Incident-Based Reporting System, also known as NIBRS. Originally developed and implemented in 1988, NIBRS has now officially replaced the UCR's traditional summary reporting system beginning in January 2021. NIBRS records crimes by incident as opposed to jurisdiction so that they can be mapped, and it drastically expands the number of offenses tracked and the amount of information reported on those offenses while also eliminating the hierarchy rule, among other improvements. The challenges with NIBRS primarily have been that it is more labor-intensive for departments than for the summary reporting system, and for most of its history, far fewer departments have actually contributed to it, limiting the overall big picture of crime that it can offer, even though the picture it does provide of the crimes it has captured is far more detailed and complete. But because of this also, NIBRS reports have taken longer to put together and release. Although much of this may certainly change now that NIBRS is the only national crime reporting system. Speaking of providing a complete picture of crime in the U.S., the main strength of the UCR is also its primary drawback. Official sources of crime are based on police records. They represent only a small portion of crimes that have actually occurred. There is a massive amount of crime that is not captured, which is known as the dark figure of crime. The vast majority of crime is never actually reported, and therefore not accounted for in police records. Official sources of crime data like police records have additional issues that are important to keep in mind. One is clerical errors, which are abundant in official records. The more information being gathered and sifted through, the more errors that are likely to add up and are harder to track. Another is the discretion inherently tied into how records are kept. Criminal justice officials have different interpretations of crime events, levels of tolerance for individual criminal behaviors that impact the circumstances under which arrests are made or not made, and variations in their willingness to record and report requested information about what is happening in their jurisdictions. Recording policies of different agencies also vary widely and reflect those agencies' priorities. Some agencies more heavily prioritize some crimes than others. 
And when you spend more time looking for particular crimes, you're going to find more of them than other crimes you're not prioritizing. And also, police agencies keep records primarily for their own use to support their mission, or because they are required to do so by law. Record keeping has improved as many agencies now have dedicated crime analysts on staff, but these systems are still designed for their own use and aren't necessarily conducive to information sharing among agencies or with policymakers, let alone for researchers to conduct their own studies using crime data. The two other most common measures of crime aim to fill in the gaps missed by data from official records, victimization surveys and self-reported offending surveys. Victimization surveys ask people about their experiences as a victim of crime. By taking this approach, we can learn more about crimes that do occur but are either not reported to the police or not recorded as a crime. The most prominent is the National Crime Victimization Survey, or NCVS, which has been ongoing in various forms since 1971. Administered by the Bureau of Justice Statistics, the NCVS is a nationally representative survey of 95,000 households and 160,000 individuals who are interviewed every six months during a three-year period about crimes they have been a victim of between each time interval. These short time intervals are designed to reduce potential memory and recall issues. Results are reported annually on personal and property crime victimization and allow numerous unique assessments such as comparisons of victims and non-victims, repeat victimizations over time, relationships between victims and offenders, reasons why crimes were reported or not reported, and experiences with the criminal justice system. The limitations of the NCVS mostly center on its complexity as it takes a great deal of time and expertise to properly analyze the data. In addition, one of its strengths is also a limitation. Selection for inclusion in the survey is based on location, meaning whoever occupies that residence is surveyed. It does not follow families or individuals who happen to move during the data collection period. Because of this location criteria, the NCVS does not capture victimization of the homeless or transient, those who move frequently. There was also a redesign of the survey in 1992, which created a break in the series of data collection, which complicates the ability to conduct long-term longitudinal analyses. Despite these limitations, though, the NCVS provides a wealth of tremendous information and a necessary contrast with crimes reported to the police. Self-reported offending surveys are similar to victim surveys, except individuals are asked about crimes they themselves have committed instead of crimes they have been victimized by. These surveys measure the frequency and type of offending behaviors unlikely to be reported to police or that don't have clearly identifiable victims, such as personal drug use. These surveys are commonly used with at-risk populations, such as with juveniles, allowing us to get information directly from potential offenders and track specific types of offending behaviors over a long period of time. Examples of self-reported offending surveys of middle and high school students are the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, the Monitoring the Future Survey, and the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Study. Some of you may remember taking these or similar surveys. Self-reported offending surveys have their own limitations. There are reliability issues with memory recall and false information, either made up offending or reluctance to report offending. This is a potential issue with victimization surveys as well. Although many studies over the years have shown this to not be a major issue and one that can be controlled, it's still important to recognize. There are also limitations in what populations are available to draw from. Aside from using an at-risk population, another common approach for self-report surveys is to sample from a population of known offenders. There's nothing inherently wrong with this strategy. There's a lot to be learned from this approach. So what is the limitation? Well, it draws from a sample of known offenders, offenders who have been identified and arrested. So it stems from official records and therefore suffers from many of the same limitations. This means if we survey known offenders, we can't assume that what we've learned applies to all offenders because we've only surveyed from a population of those who have been caught, and we don't know if those who haven't been caught differ in some fundamental way. Despite these limitations, self-report surveys are an excellent complement to official records and victim surveys. So that's a brief overview of the most common measures of crime. Of course, there are others as well that are useful in different circumstances such as snowball sampling, where the researcher essentially builds a sample through social network connections, 
which can be quite valuable for learning about populations that can be difficult to access, such as active criminals, or open source methods, where any available information about specific crimes is gathered and analyzed, which is very useful for learning about crimes that are difficult to measure or where relatively little information is known about them, such as product counterfeiting. But these are the main three. To conclude, a word of caution when using existing published sources of crime data. It is important to understand how the data was collected and how it is being reported to interpret it correctly. A researcher may think they've identified a major shift in a trend and write up these findings thinking an important discovery has been made only to find out it was actually due to survey questions being asked in a different way or alterations in how subjects are recruited or just data being collected differently. The NCVS redesign mentioned earlier, or the switch from the summary reporting system to NIBRS in the UCR are two examples of where errors like this could be made. So it is important to keep this in mind and avoid potential pitfalls that may render research results unreliable or invalid.